Hello, you're on the road less traveled with Gary L. and Gigi's Boo and RealLibertyMedia.com or RLM Radio, where everybody, all the cool kids go to RLM Radio. Hey, Gigi's Boo, you didn't know it that I was a poet, did ya? Oh, I know you're a poet. <laughs> Just like the constipated mathematician worked it out with a pencil. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> How's everybody out there in uh, RLM Radio Land and RealLibertyMedia.com? Hi, in the chat room, we've got a bunch of people over there. And if you want to be in the chat room at RealLibertyMedia.com, just come to the homepage. And about halfway down, there's a little chat applet. You can put your name in or not or something. And you can say hello to everybody here in Real Liberty Mediaville. Yeah, that's not to be confused with Margaritaville. Although sometimes I think it could be, especially on Friday nights with Freakers Ball. And that's Grimnir and Moose Girl. Grimnir being the guy who runs this place. And Moose Girl is the sidekick at Freakers Ball. And they talk about all kinds of neat stuff. Neat they stuff. They sure do. Yeah. And they play music and talk about neat stuff. And you have to catch it live if you want to listen to music. Because I don't think it, the music gets archived. So you're missing out. So you're going to need to check that out. Yeah. Well, we we rarely plug Freaker's Ball. I don't know why. I, I noticed Moose Girl in the chat room. It just, bing, came to my mind. But anyhow. It's a real great program. Yeah. I'm not a program, a show. It's a yeah. show. Yeah. Great it's a, show. A lot of fun. Yeah. It's for grown-up folks, so Atticus can't watch it. Okay. Oh, gosh. Don't even start. Atticus can't listen. Now, Atticus just yesterday, he, he was in and out, in and out, in and out. Bark, bark, bark. Every time something go on outside, he'd run outside, look around, then he'd come back in. And then he'd hear something, Ellie, and yeah, I do actually. Thanks, Grimner, for noticing. <laughs> yeah, I was going to type and tell him, yeah, you do. Yeah, well, he'd probably hear me in a second. But anyway, um, so Ellie would bark at something outside, and and sure enough, he'd Atticus jump up and run back outside, look around. Ruff, ruff, nothing going on. He come back in. Well, he did something really interesting yesterday, didn't he, Gigi's Boo? He sure did. I was talking to Gary, and I said, Atticus, I am not going to get up. Go on outside and see what it is. And he barked at me twice. Get up. That's what he was saying. And I said, no, I'm not. And he kept barking. Well, Gary got hysterical. He wanted me to get up and go look. So finally... I got up and went outside and looked, and I said, there's nothing wrong. Now, enough's enough. And he was in and out all day yesterday, and I was trying to take a nap, and I couldn't take a nap with him barking. And today I laid down to take a nap right quick, and Gary said, listen at him outside. He's just raising hell. He wanted in. And so we went to let him in, and then he wanted to do dead dog laying, all kind of crazy stuff that he does. He has great antics and he's never a dull moment with Atticus long around never but the moral of the story was that he was coming to tell you that he was tired of running in and out of that door to see what them yeah what them other chilling churn what the mother churn churn were barking about so it's your turn you go look yeah (laughs) yeah he wanted me to get up and look and I said stop I'm not gonna do it and he's a sight he really is yeah, it's pretty interesting because you really can detect these sorts of interactive behaviors with him. It's like it's like you can see the wheels spinning in his head. He's yeah, like, he's nah. smart. Yeah, and it's my my turn, <laughs> not my monkeys, not my circus. <laughs> That's right. And he leaned over and I said, "Look at you laying on your back." Gary said, "Take a picture of him so we can send it to Hal." Hal gets all a lot of the pictures and the videos. I took a picture and I said, turn around and look at me. And he turned around and he kind of did a grinning dog thing, you know, with his mouth open. And he was just laying with his paws straight up. And I said, dead dog line. Mm-hmm. And he didn't even move. And he, he is hilarious. He was tearing it up outside the other day and barking and going on. And he, there was a little dog outside our fence, part Dotson. I took a short video of that to send to Hal, and honestly, 
he was kicking dirt. He was so mad. He was just fussing. And in the top of the video, you could see the little dog all the way across the street, another neighbor's yard going across the yard. But he was still raising sand about that. He's very territorial. What's his is his. You shouldn't even come on this side of the block. He's like the mayor. My daddy calls him the mayor. He's the mayor around here. I've been threatening to put him a checkered rag on his head and tie something around it and make him a warlord. But I said I better not do that. That's not politically correct this day and time. But anyway. Shake Atticus. Another Italian restaurant would be missing a tablecloth. (laughs) Yeah. Speaking of not being politically correct. But anyhow, yeah, I do. Actually, I don't have a cold. I had a cold. Anytime you're, you're pretty much frequently exposed to school age grandkids, they're going to bring home every bizarre type of new bug that in existence. And so you catch a little bit of a cold, it's mostly a cold, that had come. And what we were talking about pre show was I don't know how many of you guys noticed this, but once you start to get better from like something like a cold, in about a day or two, you'll feel like or sound like that you're having a relapse. Mm-hmm. But there's something else going on with that that probably isn't commonly known. But Gigi Spoo, you can you can explain what's happening after with 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 your body at that point. Well, what it is 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 with anything that you have a germ or virus or anything. What doctors don't tell you is when they give you medication or when you try to take care of it yourself through other measures, the third day is usually when everything is dying, the viruses and the bacteria or whatever. What happens when something dies? It becomes necrotic. And when it becomes necrotic, it gets into your bloodstream and it makes you feel like a piece of you know what. So your body has to get over all that. And so that's why it takes you a little while to finally, what we'll call, perk up. A little sipping whiskey will help along doing that. And the doctor will tell people a lot, oh, you're going to be in here a couple of days. No, why do you tell them that? You're not going to be here a couple of days. If you're hospitalized with pneumonia, you're going to be here a little while longer. So that is what happens. Yeah. Is you, become, you become septic. It's not a terrible sepsis, but the body does become septic. Right, and your immune system kicks in yet again. Yeah, yeah, it has so, to twice. So it's kind of a rebounding thing, but it's all part of the system. So don't think because you start feeling badly again, you start sounding like you're sick again. Well, you kind of are, but it's all a natural process. That's your body reacting yet again to the necrotic tissue that from the dead organisms. It sounds so appealing. And yeah, dip them in peroxide. I I think maybe UVC might be a way to go. (laughs) But anyway, speaking of that, we had a kind of a throwback yesterday on the discussion video over at Suspect Sky. About four, three, four, five of us get together and we do a discussion video. And we actually kind of had a prepper theme going on over there yesterday. And we were talking about lots of different things to do kind of very specific prepping because it was designed to address issues like what do you do in a Carrington style event and we've talked about that here on this show before in the Carrington event you know back in the 1800s was when you had had actually several x-class flares erupt that fortunately at the time we weren't so highly technically evolved as we think we are now so the uh, EM, effectively an EMP resulted from those that affected the basic, basically it just affected the telegraphs because that's all source of electronics go. That's pretty much what was out there. You had big auroras, auroras. You could actually, they said you could read a newspaper as far south as Florida just from the aurora that was caused by that. So we were talking in terms of a weakening magnetosphere, or as Hal will point out correctly, actually, that it's a homogenization, uh, wandering poles. They they don't they they do that, and they don't always you don't always have a pole reversal as as the net effect of all that. But a pole reversal is a potential. And we don't really know exactly what happens in the case of a pole reversal because the last one that we know of 
happened about 780,000 years ago. So maybe we're due for one, but it's expected that a pole reversal could weaken the ozone layer, or in fact, maybe cause it to mostly disappear. And in the case of the ozone layer going away, you're bombarded with UV, B, and C radiation. Not to mention the other energetic particles that come from outer space that the ozone layer protects us from. Also, even a minor solar flare, you know, an M class or something like that, could have devastating results on the Earth because the magnetosphere is no longer there to deflect the energetic particles. So a lot of people don't think about this. We actually did do a show a long time ago about uh, creating an exercise that looked at the potential effects of a Carrington event type thing that might happen. So that's something we talked about yesterday and more in a prepping mode. And it's something I'll talk about a little bit more later on in the show tonight. Now, some of the things you might be interested in doing, because it's not a pretty picture. It's something like we're so technologically heavy right now that anything of that nature would immediately take down our, our power grid. And when your power grid goes down large scale, it's estimated that it would take somewhere in the neighborhood of three to six years worldwide to restore it all. So you can imagine, yeah, Frumpy, the magnetic poles, they, they wander around. And right now they're shifting around in kind of a bizarre, bizarre way. Are actually seeing evidence that the magnetosphere has been weakening over uh, pretty rapidly actually more rapidly than scientists say <laughs> they would have anticipated but we're seeing weakening magnetosphere and some people are reporting increased levels of uvb and uvc radiation at ground level so i don't know, these are things that are going on and i think it's foolhardy it's not it's not fear porn but i think it's foolhardy to ignore it because of the potential dramatic impact that something like that would have. You can imagine your your entire civilization that's based on technology would disappear in a in a matter of minutes. And what do you I mean just really think about it. What are you gonna do? What what exactly are you gonna do about that? Or what type of preparations might you generally not not go crazy and change your whole life and all that kind of crap what, what kind of general preparations might one take to mitigate certain effects from something like that but anyway i don't want to get too deep into that right now but I do want to say that Gigi's boo has a couple of stories before i jump into the stories that we have queued up here in fact let me just let me just give you a quick rundown so we'll tell you what we're going to tell you before we tell you Gigi's boo is going to talk about I'm not sure in which order, but so we'll talk about Rosemary Kennedy. Interesting, if you don't know much about her, a very interesting story, a la Kennedy's. And some of the uh, interest, some of the, the fun and interesting tours that were given back in the day, and she'll tell you about that, 19th century wise. Let's see. We're going to talk about how the NSA has tripled its collection of U.S. phone records. Some of the myths about the National Security Agency, but not so much that, but what are their real authorities and what are they supposed to do, uh, as opposed to what they really do? How about YouTube or Google or whatever, it doesn't matter, censorship? How come lawmakers just kind of ignore all that? We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about something that's very disturbing with respect to housing authorities starting to restrict arms ownership. And this is a big story, in my personal opinion. We'll talk about why. And then we'll talk a little bit about something that you might be interested in doing vis-a-vis -vis the potential weather changes or atmospheric changes or whatever. We'll talk about that. But, but I want to open up with the funny before Gigi Boo jumps off here. <laughs> I tripped over this, and it's from The Guardian. I see a lot of interesting stories come out of The Guardian. A Canadian zoo is facing criminal charges after taking their bear out for ice cream at the Dairy Queen. There's a video here that's pretty funny. The private zoo in the Canadian province of Alberta is facing charges after a bear from the facility was taken through a drive through Dairy Queen in a pickup truck and hand-fed ice cream through the vehicle window. It actually video shows the bear sticking his head out of the driver's side. Probably not the most ferocious animal on the face of the earth, but the bear known as Berkeley 
is shown leaning out of the truck's window enthusiastically licking an ice cream cone held by the owner of the Dairy Queen. Now, if you watch the video, the owner is very easy going about the whole thing, so it makes you believe that this probably isn't the first time Berkeley has been to the Dairy Queen. But they were charged under the terms and conditions terms and conditions of the zoo's permit or the zoo's permission the charges are directly related to the alleged failure of the park to notify the provincial government prior to the bear leaving the zoo so the bear can't leave without permission from the government the zoo's owner doug boss says he plans to plead guilty noting that this was the first time in the 28-year history that the zoo was facing such a charge. And he says, they may made a mistake. We're embarrassed. We took them off the property. Well, we were supposed to notify Fish and Wildlife. Send them an email. We forgot to do that. Yada, 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 yada. So they said, Mother, may I? No, he, actually, he may have, well, I don't know. Frumpy might have been driving. You never know. Could have been a driving bear. I thought that was a funny story. But Gigi's boo, why don't you take it away with uh, the stories you have? I think sometimes we forget how far as a people we have come to be politically correct or to show mercy for people. In the Victorian times, the greatest pastime, there were two great pastimes for these people during Victoria days. They were visiting incarcerated mental patients and also unwrapping mummies at parties. I don't see fun for either one of these, especially poking fun at somebody who cannot help what has happened to them. And also unwrapping mummies had to be a very dangerous thing because of all the bacteria and the germs that was in the wrapping with the the mummies. But they said that it started really the visiting of the mental institution as a form of entertainment. They had the mental patients. They called them beasts and different things were wrong with them. And they let the Victorian people just come through, observe them. Then they passed a hat to take up donations. We don't know for sure. They said that that went for the upkeep of the patients. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. I personally don't think so. I think the people that were in the mental institutions that were there as caregivers or caretakers probably kept that money. There was one case that was recorded when we were in medical school, nursing school, where they had this patient. They would put on plays and they would paint the patients with silver paint or gilded paint, gold paint, and they would die. And what happened was that the paint was toxic, but it also wouldn't give them a place to breathe. They couldn't breathe. The skin couldn't breathe. So they couldn't release the toxins. And it said in about 1770, they welcomed visitors to observe patients, sort of as a voyeuristic entertainment. And Bethlehem Royal Hospital of London, or Bedlam, as it became known, charged a shilling to see the ravishings of beasts and the patients were put on display like a human zoo. Particularly on Sundays and holidays, the scene in the galleries could be boisterous and rowdy, like a ghost train or a freak show, or indeed the surgery and autopsy demonstrations that were also offered to the London public. I almost fainted when I saw that. Surgeries and autopsies were shown to people in an open theater, How much money could a person sue somebody for that now? I just shook my head when I saw that. They said that the patients were displayed as a tactic to secure donations, like I said. And the governors encouraged high-class sightseers to help fund the asylum by paying to see the beast. The asylum entertained visitors, the spectacles. The lady said Mary Chapman did this. She left this note. The oldest psychiatric asylum in Britain, Bethlehem, began opening its doors from the early modern period as a way of courting donations from an entertained public. And access to the asylum and its patients continued in one form or another until the Victorian area stopped. The story of prying eyes and what exactly it was that they looked for tells us much about the change in popular attitudes to mental illness. 
These visits reveal the intensity of the citizens' interest in medicine during the 19th centuries and in the ways in which this interest was encouraged or curtailed by physicians. Early mental patients were considered akin to animals. Early asylums began in England as a form of imprisonment. There were those who were raving and furious and capable of cure or if not yet, are likely to do mischief to themselves or others. Until 1619, they were not even run by medical professionals. In the 1700s, conditions improved a little. The mentally ill were considered beings that, without their reason, had ascended to the level of animals. Even King George III developed mental illness, and he was retrained, sedated, and treated with many harsh procedures of the time, including bleeding, blistering, and purging. Asylums were really a place for the poor and the powerless. At the time, mental asylums served as a site where the poor and disenfranchised could be locked away when they developed any perceived mental issues. Those with money are usually cared for at home or in private asylums established for the better care of the wealthy patients. Not everyone with mental illness was sent to the asylum. Even among the poor, some people were still cared for at home, and others were left on the street as beggars nicknamed Tom O'Bedlams. In the Georgian era, asylum tourism began to drop off as cultural attitudes and understanding of the mental illness changed. The public began to be aware of the abuse of the system and to shy away from such spectacles. Starting in the 1760s, asylum tourism came to decline. At the same time, mental institutions were adapting, becoming more financially independent, and they no longer required desperate needs and bids for donations. The new regulations in the Victoria era made asylum tourism heavily class-dependent. In the Georgian era turned to Victorian, the asylum still existed, but sparingly because it became a pastime of the upper classes. Rather than curing donations, asylum set a ticket price, and only those who could afford it were admitted. In 1825, the Bedlam governors declared that guests could only visit the asylum with written permission from a governor. This meant potential visitors had high enough standing to ask for such a favor from high-ranking men. As viewing the patients for entertainment began to be looked down on, the asylum tours were advertised as a chance to view the architect and gardens connected to the building. Asylums often took up large, beautiful buildings, could be marketed toward tourists, and their grounds could be advertised in traveling guidebooks as sight to see. This allowed tourism to continue without sounding explosive to the patients. I still find it appalling. Some asylum tourists in the Victorian era were fascinated with medicine and focused on the philanthropy of these people. The visitors came to act as inspectors concerned with the care and comfort of the patients. Guests commented on how few patients were under restraint and how gentle the treatment was. In the process, Bedlam began being regarded as a benevolent institution. However, patients who were considered dangerous were kept out of sight of visitors, keeping some of the less gentle treatment away from the prying eyes. At the same time, the public was softening in their attitudes toward asylum patients. Medical professionals began to reform the treatment of mental illness. They adopted the idea that moral treatment of patients would be more beneficial for mental health. Moral treatment focused on kindness and comfort in treatment. This version was still a far cry from modern ideas of treatment, but was certainly an improvement of the past. With moral treatment, useful employment, and rest, they believed insanity could be cured in the 1850s. Bedlam administrators claimed the institution had a recovery rate of 57%. Later on, tourism helped remove the social stigma on mental illness, there were many problems with asylum tourism, but it did have a few benefits. The openness to the public helped increase confidence in psychiatric treatment and remove the stigma surrounding the mental illness. The tours demonstrated how medical methods work. 
which allayed many of the public fears about mental health treatment. The tours also helped to see patients as real people. One young woman wrote to a periodical, seemingly disappointed at a lack of spectacle, for y'all could see the patient looked and acted like other people. Now, a lot of medical professionals hated the tourism because they believed it interfered with the treatment. Asylum superintendents often found that the tourists attracted and announced to the staff and patients, telling them to try to reroute them other ways. By the end of the 19th century, asylum tourism had virtually disappeared. The physician administrators realized privacy aided in treatment. This ended a practice that, while beneficial, still exploited the patients by exposing them to curious public during the medical treatment. It was a long time before the treatment of mental health and mental illness became more progressive and less stigmatized during the era of the mental asylum tourism. It still had a long way to go. In the late 20th century, many powerful politicians and figures and influences still believed in sterilization of the mentally ill. Thousands of people were forcefully sterilized in the push to weed undesirable traits out of the population as eugenics became increasingly popular. United States Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote an opinion in the court case. Experience has shown that hereditary traits plays an important part in the transmission of insanity, etc. It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for the crime or to let them starve in society, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. The road to real moral treatment of mental health was long and a long struggle. Now, I want to tell you something. Having worked with the state hospitals and the mentally ill, it's still not a bed of roses. I think things began to get better maybe in the 70s and 80s with the treatment of the mentally ill because we had more, and I hate to say this, pharmaceuticals, but I had rather see somebody with a chemical lobotomy than a lobotomy that was done to Rosemary Kennedy. And I'm going to talk about that for a few minutes. I also want to touch base and tell you about one of Queen Victoria and Albert's grandchildren. He became insane because of syphilis, and they really thought for a while that he could have been Jack the Ripper because he was skirted off, and he was sort of erased from history. You don't hear too much about him except that he married, maybe had a child, but he frequented prostitutes, and he contracted syphilis. And if syphilis is not treated and cured, it does lead to insanity. Some of the last things that we see about him was when they said that he had been taken ill and that he was at a home for gentlemen. So it could have been that he was in an asylum in Britain for the very wealthy, where he was taken care of much better than the common man. That is true even to this day. I will say that. People that can afford private psychiatrists, private mental institutions, are treated much better than the general public. It was in the 80s, I think, that Ronald Reagan wanted to close down the mental institutions because he said it was taken away from their constitutional rights to be held. I disagree with that, and I will tell you why. Having worked as long as I had in the medical field, when the mental institutions closed down, these people became street people. They could not take care of themselves. They could not stay on their medication. They could not find food to eat. They could not find a place to sleep. Most of them ended up being street people without any care at all. If they did get a check from the government, that check was gone very quickly because they didn't have the mental capacity to take care of it. So therefore, their life turned to crime. If you will look in the prison system right now, You have so many people that are on what they call the psychiatric wards of the prison. And it's not so that they are mentally ill, that they committed horrific crimes. They did robbery, other things to stay alive. They had to steal food. 
They could not function in society. So really, were their constitutional rights taken away from them by being in a place that was safe, that they could monitor and take care of them? Maybe the care wasn't the best in the world, but it was better than what they're facing now in the prison system. I find it very, very sad that we have, as a country and as a people, we have forgotten these lost people. And that's exactly what they are. They are lost. Now, we do have group homes that they can go and stay in. And a lot of them do remain home. There's government help that comes in that will help you take care of them in your home. But there's sometimes they can't be taken care of. They need 24-hour supervision around the clock, and it's just not there anymore. The average stay in a mental institution for anybody that's schizophrenic or bipolar is usually eight to nine weeks. That takes that long for their medicine to get them stable, and they are functionable. I didn't say well. They're functionable. Okay, what do they do? They turn them right back out. They get off the medicine because the medicine makes them feel bad. They will tell you, I feel bad. I want to sleep. I don't have the energy. So the first thing they do when they get out is they go get all the caffeine they can get. They get hyped up on caffeine. The caffeine and the lack of medication throws them right back into the schizophrenia or the manic depression. They can either be manic are depressed, and they have to be watched. So I think we've done a great disservice. I want to talk a little bit about Rosemary Kennedy. Rosemary Kennedy was not mentally ill. Rosemary had a learning disability, and she had a strong will. She was also known as the beautiful Kennedy girl. She was prettier than her sisters. It's said that when her mother was giving birth to her, that the doctor couldn't get there just at the right time. And so the nurse held Mrs. Kennedy's legs together to keep from Rosemary to being born. And so she was born with a little mental deficiency, but she was functionable. Now, they had her in a lot of schools and things and tried to do. But, you know, Joe Kennedy was so afraid of being embarrassed that he did the unthinkable. When she was 23 years old, she underwent a relatively new procedure called a prefrontal lobotomy. And that was ordered by her father in an attempt to ease her emotional outburst. Her emotional outburst, they said, was she would get mad and throw a crystal vase or she would stomp her feet or do whatever. Well, if anybody ever knew anything about the Kennedys, one thing that they wanted to be sure of is that she did not act up. There was a certain persona about the Kennedys that they wanted people to think that they were the perfect people. In other words, she was an embarrassment to her family. Instead of the surgery, it was ordered by her father to help her, but instead the surgery left her mentally and physically incapacitated for the rest of her life. Rosemary, the father, made the decision to have her lobotomized. And if you want to read a really good book about Rosemary, read the book, The Missing Kennedy. Joe Kennedy said that he thought he was doing what was best for her. And he was searching what was best for his family. He put her in the care of several nuns who took care of her for more than 30 years. Joe and his wife refused the popular alternative of the time, putting their daughter away in a mental institution never to be seen again. Instead, they enrolled her in a series of schools and asked her siblings to look out for her. They fought the whole mess up until she was a young woman, and suddenly things changed. It said as Rosemary entered her late teens, her parents saw less of the affectionate, dutiful, and eager-to-please young woman they knew and loved and more the violent outbursts. She would scream and yell and throw things, like I said. Meanwhile, despite the American Medical Association of warnings, lobotomies were being touted by a vocal few as hope for people suffering from serious mental illness. And her father latched onto that hope. Without his wife's knowledge, he took Rosemary to see Dr. Walter Freeman. Oh, my God, he was terrible. This man was, he wanted to get Nobel Peace Prize. He wanted to get all these 
recognitions in, in medicine, that he had really did something for the mentally ill. He was a very controversial neurologist, psychiatrist, and he was a professor at George Washington University who had gained fame for popularizing lobotomies in America. They said that Joe took her to the best at the time. It was a cure for all. People were so eager for some help that they just grabbed onto it. The doctor diagnosed Rosemary with agitated depression and promised Joe a lobotomy would put an end to her rages and render her happy and content. In the fall of 1941, Dr. Friedman, insisted by Dr. Watts, performed a free frontal lobotomy on Rosemary at George Washington University Hospital. She was never the same. They said somewhere, it's not in here, but it was somewhere else I read that when they put, you know, he did the ice pick in the eye, both right up in the eye to the frontal lobe, that he had her to talk. And he wiggled the ice pick, and then all of a sudden, she couldn't talk, and she was drooling. He really botched it. He told them, after it was over with, he said that her recovery would be slow and complicated. When you do any kind of operation, there's swelling around the tissue that had been damaged, and the swelling impedes the function of the nerve cells and wires that come from those nerve cells. When the swelling recedes, those cells and structures can start working again. After that botched surgery, Rosemary was left with mental capacity of a toddler. She could not walk. She couldn't form a sentence or follow simple directions. She was forced to relearn most of the basic skills, but some would never be recovered. The frontal lobe is the pilot of your brain. It controls the executive function, which directs everything. The theory behind it is essentially preventing the direction of impulses. When one emerges from a lobotomy, one becomes docile, placid, apathetic, and devoid of effect. And what would become a decades-long secret for the Kennedy family, Joe hid Rosemary away at St. Colita, a Catholic facility for the mentally disabled in Jefferson, Wisconsin, where she was cared for by a nun. It wasn't until 20 years later when Joe had a stroke in 1961 that Rosemary's mother and eight siblings learned the entire truth about what happened. Despite widespread criticism of his work following Rosemary's surgery, Freeman went on to perform 1,000 more lobotomies and to create the popularized transorbital lobotomy in which he used the ice pick to enter the patient's brain through the eye socket. He was finally banned from operating in 1960 after one of his long-term patients died from a brain hemorrhage following her third lobotomy. Cannot believe somebody lived through three of them. The lobotomy was later labeled the surgery of the soul. If a patient was agitated and violent before the operation, afterward it seemed as though his or her personality had been erased. But the lobotomy Joe Kennedy order wreaked havoc on his daughter. Joe's grandson, Anthony Shriver, offered an optimistic take on Joe's motives. The experts in the field recommended this procedure to give her a more peaceful and productive life. He had a relentless desire for all of his children to be the best and to give them the best. He had a track record of being determined to give his children the best of everything. The goal was to enhance her life. She could not even walk. They said that after Joe died, the children began to go see her, and they brought her to the family compound a lot so that she could be with them. They were all very hurt because, see, Rosemary was with them in England. She was presented to the queen and king. She lived a very full life. But Joe's biggest concern, what they didn't tell you in this article, was that Rosemary, even though she was a young woman with maybe a little bit of slowness to her, he was afraid that she would get out and maybe become pregnant because her sisters and everybody were dating and getting married and all this. But her sister, the Shriver, I can't remember her name, she's the one that did the Special Olympics. She formed that in honor of her. And Rosemary passed away with her family at her side in 2005. 
Now, she lived a very, very good life at this home in Wisconsin. She was not with the other patients. Joe built a house for her, and she had her own home, her own cottage there with a housekeeper and people to take care of her, the nuns. But I find it very sad that this woman, who probably could have functioned if she'd have had somebody to really take care of her, instead of a father who was so embarrassed that the Kennedy name would be tainted, this happened to her. My heart bleeds for her and always has. And I just think, look at what happened to the other Kennedys through the years. So I wonder what Joe thought about that. But anyway, I found all this very interesting. And being a psychiatric nurse, I would. I hope I didn't bore you too much, and I'm going to let Gary take over. No, thanks. That's really good, because there is a thread that's running through all this in the show tonight. And it may be not immediately obvious, but what you were describing is essentially someone who has been judged incompetent, right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh Okay, so what exactly does it mean to be legally incompetent? And the Legal Information Institute says that you have a lack of legal uh, legal ability to do something, especially to testify or stand trial. It's also called incompetency. could be caused by various types of disqualification, inability, or unfitness. Here's the money phrase. Someone who is judged incompetent by means of a formal hearing may have a guardian appointed by the court, but sometimes the sole disqualification is merely your age. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the key phrase here is someone who is judged incompetent. Who has the ability to judge you as being incompetent? Well, that would be your courts, right? That's exactly right. And do you not think that people of, of the status of Kennedys at that time did not have mm-hmm. the ability to influence a court to uh, judge a ham sandwich as incompetent. And can that same thing happen today? Can it happen? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, go ahead. It happens all the time. It's really sad, and you see it. I mean, you've got, there's horror stories of people who have been put in mental institutions that don't need to be there. And they are, they're still, a, they're, they're better Please believe me when I tell you they've come a long way. Mm -hmm. But abuse still happens, Mm -hmm. and it's bad. So I think what they needed to do was keep these places open and police them. You know, police them. Don't let them know when you're coming in. Police them. Sad to me. This is so sad. Yeah. She could have lived a fairly relatively normal life had this not happened to her. I guess the direction I'm going with that is how easy if if you don't fit in with the status quo so to speak how easy might it be to put you in a position of being incompetent and how far a stretch is it to take that incompetence or equate that incompetence to something that's called indigency Mm -hmm. legally an indigent is a person so poor and needy that he or she cannot provide the necessities of life such as food, clothing, decent shelter, decent shelter, we're going to key on that, for him or herself. Okay, well, we were talking earlier about a, you know, a, techno, a potential, a possible technological da- uh, downturn, for lack of a, I guess that's a soft way to, to describe it. So in that event, would not many people become homeless, right? Yes, yes, they could become homeless, yeah. Well, mm-hmm. sure, if, if if there's no electricity and there's no heat and there's no place to go, you're probably going to be homeless. Would that, in fact, cause you to become indigent? Probably, in a legal, mm-hmm. legal definition. But short of that, how do we deal with indigent people today? That are they're actually, as it, turns, as it appears to be turning out, they're becoming legally impaired just because they're indigent, and here's why I'm saying that. In a Breitbart article, a housing developer with multiple properties in New Jersey is warning that tenants who possess, store, or carry firearms on their developments will face a notice to vacate. 
The developer, RPM Development Group, issued a notice of the policy, a notice of the policy to all residents, and that notice was, was acquired and published by the New Jersey Second Amendment Foundation. Well, a couple things in that first sentence. They issued a notice of the policy. Well, so was that not part of their tenancy agreement? This suggests that maybe it wasn't. But they sent him a notice anyway that this is what's going to be. And the general counsel for RPM confirmed that the policy says no one will be permitted to store or carry a rifle or gun or any other type of firearm of any kind in the building or, or on the grounds. And it goes on to say what happens to you if you do that. That kind of grabbed my attention. I'm saying, wait a minute, a housing developer with multiple properties in New Jersey. So I took a look at RPM development. Who is that exactly? And the very first sentence sent a chill through me because it says, at RPM Development Group, our goal is to create high-quality, affordable housing. Now, what's hidden in that in that phrase, affordable housing? There's something called, what, Section 8, Gigi's Boot? Yep. There you go. And indi- government, government. Yeah. And indigent people can use the Section 8, quote, benefit to gain housing. And it goes on to say sustainable building. Where have we heard that term? Sustainable is one of the core values that guides our work. When affordable housing is done well, we believe it can serve as a transformational resource, transformational, where have we seen that term? Resource for residents and a source of beauty and vibrancy for surrounding communities. A little bit more information here. Our work has included new construction on underutilized land. Now, where in, where would you find underutilized land in New Jersey? Maybe on landfills? And adaptive reuse of industrial properties, which could be an old chemical plant. The restoration of historic buildings and multi-phase initiatives to increase affordable housing options in urban and suburban communities. There's a whole lot hidden just in this three paragraphs of their about page. We have worked with cities, suburban towns, local housing authorities, key phrase, and state and federal agencies key phrase, to create high-quality housing options for New Jerseyans and are experienced in combining multiple forms of financing to bring projects to fruition, and so forth, and so forth, and so on. And they also talk about using community resources. Now, uh, to me, as far as I understand, uh, the term community resources is just a fancy way of saying taxpayer money. So, what do you got going on here? What is going on here? Well, let's think a minute about the rewilding of America and the whole, at least reputed, objective of Agenda 2030 to begin moving people into compact, urban, urbanized areas. So, they move you into a place like RPM Development Group has. And while this may, in fact, just be a prototype for something else to come in the future, because I look at, I can't find any ownership information about this company yet. So I don't know who's behind this. I, you know, it has the directors, you know, the front people and all that good stuff and the contracting staff, development staff and all that stuff. But who these people are exactly, who's behind this whole operation, I don't know. But when I see some of the words that are being used, I have a pretty good idea. People talk about their Second Amendment rights and all this kind of stuff. Well, guess what, Jack? If you're indigent as the result of whatever may occur and you need a place to live, you have a choice. You can live in a hole, in a cave, in the woods, in the mountains, and and eat roots and grubs. Or you can apply to apply an application which you apply the indigency status to yourself and go in one of these very nice looking um, don't get me wrong they're very nice looking rental houses but guess what happens you'll not have the ability to possess store or carry arms 
anywhere on their development. Do you not see where this is going? Gary, is that not against the uh, constitutional law? Well, you see, that's where the funny, I'm glad you asked the question because that's what a lot of people could say that. But what, this is a contractual private arrangement. Even though, now, it'd be interesting, it would be a really interesting argument to say because they may be using community funding, i.e. taxpayer money, that they may, in fact, be restricted by constitutional guidelines. It could be an interesting argument to make. Good luck with that, though, because this is a private arrangement, and you're, you're it's just like uh, an employer that bans you from carrying a weapon at the workplace. That's not violating your so-called constitutional rights because that is a private contract that supersedes it. But that was a very good question. I'm glad you brought that up. But do you not see where this is heading? Oh, yeah. It's fascinating. It's fascinating to watch, and I have links for... And I'm not just picking on RPM. Don't get me wrong. This is just ha- this is just happened to be what jumped up, and I'm sure if we really looked... We'd see other operations like this coming into play. And we have links to, I mean, they're nice-looking properties. I mean, they may not be in the best part of town, but if you think about it, you go around and look at some of these new revitalization programs and the new properties that are going up, and it turns out that they're Section 8 capable. Now you start to see the evidence starting to pile up that maybe this is a way in which they will disarm you. First, you'll be indigent. You will have no place to live. And for those who choose to make this application of indigency, and now you've just given up your rights. And isn't that what happened to a lot of these mental patients, Jesus Boo? That they they were indigents? and ruled to be incompetent. Those two terms seem to be going hand in hand here. So they're incompetent, so they're turned over as to be wards of the state and have their brains scrambled or whatever else experimented on or whatever else is handy at the time. In any case, they're under control. And isn't this all simply a matter of control? It's all about that. And so we can protect the more enlightened ones, the more affluent ones are protected from the rabble. And isn't this a theme that's run throughout history, particularly Western history? It's unbelievable. So, at, uh, wow, 804, Gigi's boom. We just did not even touch on some of this other stuff. I think I'm going to leave that we can away. We can wait for next week on I, it. I think so, because sometimes these shows take on a life of their own and when when at least when i start to see pieces of the puzzle falling together in real time as we make these shows you just have to go with it you have to follow follow the yellow brick road but i'm telling you this is in intelligence parlance this is a huge intelligence indicator threat indicator about this housing development thing yeah and Tie that in with Agenda 2030. Tie that in with what I say potential, but there's a lot of evidence to show that the people in the know are aware that something is coming. And it could just very well be something tied to this whole magnetic pole shifting, moving around, this kind of stuff. At least the belief that there is a high likelihood of of something very, Mm -hmm. very dramatic occurring. So you don't think they're going to be ready for that? I mean, you're not dealing with stupid people here. That, you know, as, as Hal likes to point out on his show, Behind the Woodshed for 3 to 5 here every Sunday, you have an evil genius. There's an evil genius that's operating throughout all of this. And if you don't believe that, you... Uh, Something's wrong. Yeah, I mean, there, there's something like the word Pollyanna comes to mind. But there's an evil genius that that exists and has existed for a very long time because you can see this very same thread moving throughout all of our known history. So be prepared. Do something. I wanted to talk about, wow. Yeah, we're going to have to save it because I wanted wanted to make a segue out of the prepper type of kind of stuff, but we're out of time. Yeah, we like that temperature stuff. Yeah. Let me just just put this in here right quick. Um, On the prepper deal, Gary and I were talking about we had a water 
line that broke here and there was no water for 48 hours. People were going crazy, jerking water off the shelves. Well, Gary and I are a little smarter than that. We take a lot of, we store a lot of water, keep it out of the sunlight. We store it. We have plenty of water to drink. And if push came to shove, we could always go to our hidden water source, which is secured that nobody can get to. And I saw, as it said on the the article that I was talking about, Bedlam. People were jerking water off the shelves. You could not believe how people were doing. And I told Gary, I said, Gary, we need to talk about prepping again. And everybody, please, you can forage a little bit for food, but please make sure you've got water. Water, water, water. Store it. Keep it out of sunlight. Buy you up some cases of water to drink, but do get some water. Be sure, because that was just a prelude of what happened, what will happen when it comes down to it. Okay, I'm done. Okay, well, that's pretty much I think we're all done. (laughs) We're way over time. I guess some of the editing will take some of the slack out of that, although I I didn't sense a lot of slack in tonight's show. Maybe we're, maybe after all this time, we're starting to get a little bit better about that, about that, all the uh, verbal artifacts that that's very natural for people, the ahs and the ums and the nows and, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, that's another one, <laughs> verbal artifacts. Get a little bit, maybe we're getting a little bit better about that, but that's what I try to edit out during the edits. Anyhow, thanks so much. And Gigi's boo, you have anything to share? Yes, I do. Remember to always take the road less traveled. And I love y'all big to my heart. Have a good night. Yeah, Jeezy's Boo, thanks so much. And great stories, by the way. Thanks for the audience out there for hanging in there with us. It's a pretty good show. And we did use uh, a different intro this week, uh, Night of the Owl by Kevin McCloy, the royalty-free music. Thanks again for joining us here on The Road Less Traveled. As Hal says in the chat room, follow The Road Less Traveled. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.